Marcus Petrius, Praetor around 64 BCE. Marcus Petrius is more or less a perfect example of why I began this series in the first place. Not only is he an overlooked but important figure in this period of history, but he also is someone who really represents the trends of his era. If we look at Petrius's career and compare him with other self-made military men, whether we're talking about Gaius Marius, Aulus Hirtius, or Panza, we see that there is a clear pattern of Romans in the late Republic who were able to advance themselves by their military skill. Petrius was not quite as successful as any of those three men. However, he is still someone who really rose above his initial station in life. And much like Hirtius and Panza, he attached himself to one of the major stars of the late Roman Republic. But whereas Hirtius and Panza sided with Caesar, Petrius was a Pompey man through and through. And as we'll see, he also really delivered the goods for Cicero during his consulship in 63 BCE. So let's look at the life of Marcus Petrius. Marcus Petrius was born in 110 BCE, making him an almost exact contemporary of both Cicero and Pompey. He was born in the region of Picenum in eastern Italy, which is to the north of Samnium and to the east of Umbria. He was a client of Pompey, and this is presumably a relationship which went back many generations. As a new man, he must have hailed from either the local municipal aristocracy of one of the cities of Picenum, or else he may have been someone of equestrian status who had finally acquired both the wealth and the requisite ambition to try to embark on a political career in Rome. We see that this was also true of Cicero. His family had the wealth, but he was the first to actually use it to try to go to Rome and enter the Senate. Petrius may have been someone, though, who was from a little bit of a lower status when compared to Cicero, but still it's clear that he grew up as a very wealthy man, although when compared with the people in the Senate, he was on the poorer side. And unlike some of his contemporaries like Cicero, who was known as an orator, or Varro, who was known as a scholar and used that as part of his sort of political appeal, Petrius was a soldier through and through, and really nothing more. When the social war broke out in Italy in 91 BCE, Marcus Petrius was 19 years old. It's hard to know whether if at that time he realized that this would not only be his first call to arms, but his only call to arms as he would more or less remain in military service for the rest of his life. During this conflict, he happened to be lucky enough to serve under his local patron, Pompeius Strabo. Pompeius Strabo was one of the best generals during the Social War, which raged on for three years, and really saw lots of inconclusive and bloody fighting all across Italy. Pompeius Strabo won a great deal of fame, and that fame was passed on to his son, Gnaeus Pompeius, who we know today as Pompey the Great. Pompey was able to take over his father's veterans and fight on behalf of Sulla against Marius and that faction. And this made Pompey one of the chief men in the state at a young age. As I mentioned earlier, Pompey was approximately the same age as Petrius, and I presume that during the social war when they were in camp together, they probably became good friends since they were about the same age and fighting under uh, Pompey's father. When Pompey was sent to Spain in 76 to help participate in the Sertorian War, which wasn't going well and had been inconclusively dragging on for four years already, Petrius accompanied him and would stay with him for the duration of his service there, which ended up being five whole years from 76 to 71. Fighting in Spain was notoriously rough, and if the social war had not been enough to toughen up Petrius, then certainly the Sertorian War would have finished his military education. By 62, Petrius had served in the office of Praetor. As I mentioned earlier, this could have happened around the year 64 or so, it's not exactly clear. And unfortunately for Petrius, this would be the highest office he would ever hold. It was not unusual for new men to not make it to the consulship, 
When we think of a lot of new men, we tend to think of the two most famous, Marius and Cicero, who of course did make it. But Petrius was actually a lot more typical of a new man in that he did not make it. However, he made it to the second highest office, and he would continue to serve in a military capacity for about 20 years after attaining his highest office. So he was someone who kept, stayed dedicated and continued to work for Pompey. When we think of the Catalinarian conspiracy, we tend to see things through the lens of Cicero's perspective that we have preserved in his surviving orations on the subject, but even more so the account by Sallust who wrote about 20 years later. What we see is that we have a clash of two great personalities. Cicero, the orator, who is now the consul, is upholding the status quo and trying to stand up for what he believes to be the inheritance of all good men, the rule of law, and the defense of property. Whereas Catiline is supposed to represent all that is evil in the world. He wants to overthrow the Senate in order to pay off his many debts and keep his status. Of course, all of our accounts of the Catalinarian conspiracy are deeply biased. We have no idea what Catiline's version of the story was, or even what his goals actually were. At any rate, though, um, there is one glaring deficiency in what is otherwise a brilliant account by Sallust. Sallust suffers from the handicap of hindsight, and by that what I mean is that when he chose to highlight personalities other than Cicero and Catiline, the people whom he chose were Caesar and Cato the Younger. And the reason why he chooses to highlight their contributions to the Senate debate is not because those contributions were deeply impactful, but rather because he knows the impact that these two individuals will have on the politics of the next couple of decades. And what he does is show them in an episode which presages the respective courses of both of their careers while also revealing their characters. At the same time, Petrius was more important to the resolution of the conflict, and there was no way to know at the time that he would be unable to reap the benefits of his actions during the Catalinarian conspiracy. So, to really play out what I mean by all this, let's go through the events of the Catalinarian conspiracy that Petrius was involved in. So Catiline, once his conspiracy had been exposed in the Senate by Cicero, decided to flee from Rome in order to rally his supporters in the countryside and form an army. At that time, the Senate duly declared him to be a public enemy and raised its own force to go after him. Cicero's colleague, Gaius Antonius Hybrata, was selected to lead an army in order to crush the forces of Catiline. Hybrida, though, was a former political ally of Catiline, and it appears that he was a bit on the fence about this whole affair. Cicero had to make a deal with him at one point to get him to cooperate with the um, outlawing of Catiline. So Hybrida was at best an indifferent ally of Cicero during this whole affair. And you can imagine he's not super thrilled about having to go after his former friend. Catiline, meanwhile, now that the Romans are raising up an army against him, has his support dwindling. Plenty of people were desperate and poor and were looking for someone who would defend them and help them pay off their debts, but once it became clear that fighting with Catiline was a probable death sentence, many of his supporters started to dwindle. There were two armies in the field that were coming after Catiline, one led by Hebrida and one led by another official. And Catiline, in order to restore the confidence of his various subordinates, decided to strike out at Hebrida before he could um, link up with the other Roman force. And the idea being that if he could win a quick victory, this could restore confidence and keep the war going. So this sets the stage for the only real battle of the Catalinarian conspiracy. During the winter of 63 into the early days of 62, Catiline was wandering around Etruria looking for more supporters. At one point, his army was up to 10,000 men, but as I mentioned earlier, it began to dwindle as men began to lose hope that he would be able to actually defeat the Roman state. 
In January of 62, Hebrida and Catiline encountered each other near the city of Pistoria in Etruria. By this time, Catiline's force had dwindled down to 3,000 or so men, and in order to get the most out of his increasingly demoralized and small army, he decided to put their back facing the mountains, so that way the only way forward was through the enemy army. The consul Hebrida was still not enthused about this campaign. Perhaps he foresaw the political consequences of killing Roman citizens without a proper trial, something that would come to haunt Cicero several years later. At any rate, in order to either avoid those political consequences or else because he couldn't face Catiline for whatever reason, Hebrida decided to turn over command of the army to his legate Petrius. And Hebrida's official excuse was that he was suffering from an attack of gout and that he was unable to walk properly, but most likely it was simply because he did not really want to participate. So now Petrius is in command, and it will be he who faces off with Catiline. There's a certain irony in this. Marcus Petrius was a new man, someone whose family had never held a senatorial office, and he was not among the richest men in the Senate. I seriously doubt he had the kind of money required to really mount a proper consular campaign. Meanwhile, on the other side, there is a force of mostly indebted people, supposedly a bunch of freedmen, slaves, and landless farmers who were fighting under Catiline, a patrician, albeit a very poor patrician. Ultimately, in this battle, Catiline and his men fought hard, but they were outnumbered by Petrius. We don't really know how many men Petrius had, but he probably had at least a full legion, which would have been around 5,000 men, possibly quite a few more. And in the end, Petrius was able to break Catiline's flank and then roll up his motley force, pinning them against the mountains and butchering them. As for um, Catiline himself, he acquitted himself valiantly and died as a true Roman. When they found his body, he was deep within the ranks of the senatorial force, and he had clearly killed many Roman soldiers before they took him down, and all of his wounds were in the front, and they were many. So Petrius had won an important victory, although it was kind of an inevitable one. But as I mentioned, he doesn't really seem to gain anything from this politically, although one could argue that the Senate should have given him some degree of gratitude given that they had one consul, Cicero, who was militarily clueless, and another who didn't have the stomach to pull off such a battle. The next time we hear about Marcus Petrius, it's about seven or so years later, and now he is once again working under Pompey, although this time in a more or less independent capacity. In 55, in order to balance out the triumvirate and make sure that Crassus and Pompey also held proconsular commands, Pompey took up command of Rome's provinces in Spain. Now, Pompey's role in the triumvirate at this time was to hold down the fort in Rome itself to make sure that the Senate kept giving Caesar what he needed in Gaul and to make sure that the right people held all of the key magistracies to make sure that the triumvirs were able to get all the things they needed. Around this time, Crassus decided that he needed to pull his weight and really increase his prestige to maintain the balance of the triumvirate so this is around the time he decides to go to the east. We all know what happened there. Anyhow, um, Pompey, in order to fulfill his role as the guy who made sure that things went according to plan in Rome, could not actually go to Spain as proconsular governor. So while he assumed this command, he actually sent out his legates to do all of the work for him. And the two most prominent of these legates were none other than his usual friends, Lucius Afranius and Marcus Petrius. Both Petrius and Afranius were still in Spain when civil war eventually broke out between Caesar and Pompey in the year 49. So for about six years or so, Petrius was more or less an independent governor of a Roman province far removed from the capital and I imagine he was more or less free to do as he pleased. This must have been a welcome change of pace for him. 
Caesar was able to quickly overrun Italy, and by March of 49, he was in a position to attack the Pompeians on other fronts. He had to make a decision. Should he go west against the seven or so legions that Pompey had stationed there, or should he go after Pompey himself and the senators who supported him? They were currently in Greece and Epirus without very many men. In the event, Caesar decided that it was wise to go after the army and then bag the leaders later. Accordingly, he decided to invade Spain. In Spain, Afranius and Petrius had five of their seven legions gathered near the border, and these were full-strength, mostly newly recruited legionaries. So that's a pretty formidable force. However, Caesar actually had six legions under his command, but these were veteran legions, including the legendary 10th legion. While Caesar has an obvious advantage in terms of having much more experienced troops, the problem is that because of the way legions were recruited, these units were all under strength. They had just been fighting in Gaul, and they had taken casualties over the years, which were not replenished. So in terms of pure numbers, the advantage actually was with Afranius and Petrius. In terms of who was in overall command of the Pompeian army in Spain, it was almost certainly Lucius Afranius since he had held the consulship in the year 60 and was therefore senior to Marcus Petrius. However, because the two men had worked together so often and were presumably good friends, they actually in practice probably more or less shared command. And in fact, Caesar's account of the campaign gives Petrius quite a bit of agency and implies that he was making command decisions without having to go through Afranius. But technically speaking, Afranius would have been the commander. After some initial maneuvering in the late spring and early summer, the two armies would finally clash near the city of Alerta. Afranius ended up posting his men near this city on a plain that was separated from the city by a hill. Caesar quickly realized that the key position on the battlefield was the hill that was between the city and the main camp of Afranius and Petrius. Therefore, he sent one of his units, the 9th Legion, at this hill. This resulted in a five-hour struggle between the 9th Legion primarily and the defenders of the hill. Um, Afranius, once he saw that Caesar was going for it, sent reinforcements, and that was the main focus of this battle. This was actually a pretty small-scale and seemingly indecisive fight. Caesar had about 70 men and one um, centurion die with hundreds more wounded, while about 200 or so soldiers and several Pompeian centurions fell. And while that doesn't sound all that bad, what this battle actually did was thoroughly demoralize the Pompeian legions. Although they had held the high ground and had the numbers and they were able to rain down projectiles from a higher position, meaning that they were getting extra velocity and accuracy, they had still lost. So this meant that Caesar's men were so much better than them that they could attack uphill, outnumbered, and win. This shattered the morale of the men, and both of the Pompeian commanders realized that they were going to have to win by some means other than by direct action. Luckily for them, the um, mountain snow was melting and flooding would really slow down more fighting. The Battle of Alerta was fought in early to mid-June, but the two armies would then be separated by floodwaters for over a month. During this inactivity, both sides suffered from the spring flooding, especially the Caesarians, who actually had a plague breakout within their ranks. And I don't know the exact identity of this disease, but it was one which claimed some lives. It doesn't seem to have been too terrible, however, as when the flooding abated, Caesar was able to cross the Sycorus River and pursue Afranius and Petrius. Once Caesar was across the Sycorus, Afranius withdrew from the city of Alerta and tried to retreat deeper into the hinterlands. During this roundabout pursuit, which seems to have gone in a circle, Petrius caught many of Caesar's men fraternizing in camp, exchanging supplies, and shooting the shit with the Pompeian troops, 
and decided that this was bad for morale as it would give his men the idea that they could surrender and join the enemy. So he rounded up and executed the fraternizing Caesarian soldiers. For whatever reason, Afranius and Petrius tried to retreat back toward Alerta, but this ended up getting them entrapped. So Caesar was able to surround their army in its camp and laid siege to it for three days. They were not prepared to undergo a siege in their camp and they didn't have supplies. So on the third day, on August 2nd of 49, Afranius and Petrius had to surrender all five of their legions to Caesar. Caesar, shortly after that, was able to march deeper into Spain and acquire two other legions who would have had no chance unless they had been combined with the five legions of Afranius and Petrius. So while Petrius probably did a good job as a governor for six years, his tenure as an independent or semi-independent commander during the Civil War turned out to be a complete and total catastrophe. How much of this was his fault and how much was simply the result of facing a brilliant general with really elite troops is hard to say. However, it was still an unabated catastrophe. When they surrendered with their five legions on August 2nd, 49, both Petrius and Afranius received pardons from Caesar. This is actually a poisoned pill. Being pardoned was an act of mercy, but it was also an insult for a Roman aristocrat. The implication of receiving a pardon is that you've done something wrong and that the person granting the pardon had authority over the person receiving the pardon, i.e. Caesar was acting as if he were legally correct and as if these men were his inferiors. Pardons were things that masters granted to slaves or that Romans granted to barbarians, especially when Caesar was being accused of trying to overthrow the traditional prerogatives of the Senate in favor of his own personal power. This was seen as yet another act of hubris and tyrannical behavior. Not to mention that for proud men like Petrius, this was something that was a really hard pill to swallow that Caesar held it in his power to decide whether he would live or die. And because he decided to violate this pardon, it meant that Petrius would more or less have to resolve to fight to the death in some way. Because if he were to be caught again after having fought Caesar, Caesar would have every right from a legal standpoint to have him executed, and no one would really bat an eye at it. So when Petrius rejoins with Pompey, he knows exactly what he's doing, and he knows that if Pompey is not successful, then he will be executed by his hated enemy, Julius Caesar. Ilerda and its aftermath were the first time that Petrius had ever tasted a true and important defeat in his military career, which by this point was about four decades long. So one can imagine that when he got back to the camp with Pompey and most of the senior senators, that he most likely just kept a low profile and didn't talk too much in war councils since a lot of his credibility would have been diminished. Not to mention that these particular senators, the more conservative faction, were very obsessed with rank and as both a new man and only a pro-preter, Petrius really did not have a lot of standing with most of the people in the war council. However, once Pompey managed to win at Dyrrhachium and force Caesar to retreat deeper into Greece, I imagine Petrius began to feel like he once again would emerge on the winning side and once again reap the benefits of serving under Pompey the Great. However, at Pharsalus, largely due to bad advice and pressure that Pompey received from many of the senior senators such as Metellus Scipio, who knew absolutely nothing about military affairs, Pompey ended up snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, and Caesar won one of, if not his greatest victory. So, despite a two-to-one numerical advantage, the forces of Pompey in the Senate are defeated at Pharsalus, and Pompey will flee to Egypt. Meanwhile, most of the other Pompeians present will end up going to Africa, Ultimately, in Africa, the man who takes over command is the senior-ranking consul, Metellus Scipio. 
and it would have been very difficult for the Pompeian faction to have found a worse commander than Metellus Scipio, who was a thoroughgoing moron. Also in Africa at this time, serving under the inspired leadership of Metellus Scipio, were Titus Labienus and Cato the Younger. At the Battle of Thapsus in 46, Caesar had arrived in Africa to deal with the Pompeians, and Petrius assumed the field and did his part. However, Thapsus once again ended up being a great victory for Caesar. So, in the aftermath of the battle, we see that Petrius once again is on the run. However, this time he knows that he will not be able to get away. While Petrius may not have been the most impressive man of his era, he was still important and he was involved in many of the most pivotal moments of that time. However, he chose the losing side in the Civil War and he knew that the jig was up for him after the defeat at Thapsus. He was not the only Roman to choose suicide, however. Cato more famously committed suicide after Thapsus to avoid having to be disgraced with Caesar's pardon. And that seems to be the story that most people remember. However, I would argue that this story of how Petrius died is actually a lot cooler. So after the Battle of Thapsus, Petrius fled in the company of King Juba I of Numidia. Juba had been a staunch friend of Pompey for many years and had also hated Julius Caesar for just as long. At some point, perhaps in the 60s, Juba had journeyed to Rome and Caesar had humiliated him in some way during a trial by grabbing his hair or doing something else and it made a bunch of senators laugh at Juba. So basically Caesar took him in front of a bunch of aristocrats and made him look like Rome's puppet. And for that, Juba held a deep grudge. Not only that, but during the early phases of the Civil War, Caesar had dispatched a few legions under the Tribune Curio to secure Africa for the Caesarian cause. And Juba had helped the Pompeian governor to defeat this force. And when he had captured several senators after defeating Curio, Juba had made the decision to have them executed. And because he was a foreigner who had executed Roman citizens, Juba had 0% chance at getting a pardon from Caesar. Therefore, since Petrius was already a marked man for having violated a previous pardon, and since Juba was a dead man for the reasons I've already outlined, the two of them decided to make a suicide pact together when they reached a via near the famous battle site of Zama. And this suicide pact is interesting because rather than help each other in an assisted suicide, they would instead fight a duel to the death and then have the winner commit suicide. In Appian's account, Petrius was the winner of this duel and then he offed himself with the help of a slave, possibly having the slave hold the sword while he ran into it. But in the pseudo Caesarian account written by one of Caesar's soldiers, it is actually Juba who wins the duel and then has a slave help him kill himself. At any rate though, um, you have to remember that by this point, Petrius was an old man, so most likely he did not win the duel. But either way, the fact that he went out in this fashion is pretty badass, and I think that it redeems some of the bad choices that he made as a Pompeian and as someone who sort of mindlessly followed around Pompey for 40 plus years. So anyhow, that is the life of Marcus Petrius, someone who may not be the most intelligent or accomplished of the Romans of his period, but is still someone worth remembering as being somewhat typical of his era, and also the kind of guy who really made Pompey able to achieve the greatness that he is known for today.